almost always going to take years before it, it gets to patients because that's something that's really new. That's you 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 don't have human experience with it. Uh, it it's uh, you have to have careful testing, of course. But the medicines that are already there, that are not glamorous, uh, that are are uh, sitting around. There's uh, there just isn't the uh, nowhere in the system is there a champion to push these through. So we have to have our own organizations uh, have to do that. So that's, uh, I'll leave it at that unless there are, uh, are questions later and open for however you want to proceed from here. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> That, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. This is, okay, uh, uh, this is uh, lentinin or lentinin. Uh, it's ex extracted from the shiitake mushroom. It's used in Japan along with chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, and uh, uh, there's very preliminary uh, indications that it might be uh, uh, highly useful. In fact, the, the one person reported three years ago in, uh, in a letter in The Lancet and uh, reported in depth in other medical journals worked well enough that she went from antibody positive to antibody negative, from actually just above the cutoff line that they used to, to just below. And uh, uh, this patient seemed to be proceeding toward, toward ARC and AIDS and, and is, is uh, entirely well and is well you know, three years later. Well, that doesn't prove it works, but, but that would seem to prove that we ought to take a look at it. But you see, some company has the rights to it. They, they're not saying what they're doing, uh, um, and uh, it just seems to be Sitting there, the, uh, uh, the, the questions arisen in some of these cases, I can't say it's true for, for that particular instance, but you see, it costs so much to get a drug developed that it can be more profitable for a company to hang on to the rights of, uh, to a, a drug, not do anything with it, let it sit there because it might just happen to hit and be valuable later. In other words, that's free just to hold on to the rights, except that you, you do run out of the patent life after a certain time, but other than that, it's free, whereas if you develop it, that's millions of dollars before you're ever going to make a penny in, in profit on selling the drug. Uh, and uh, then you've got the competitors, you've got competitors who are ahead of you, you've got all kinds of, of, uh, of, of, of things that, that make it unlikely, uh, that make it likely that the drug will never actually go to market. So you see the commercial incentives are in the wrong way, and, and, and also we should mention the, uh, uh, the, the incentive for stock manipulation takes years and years to get a thing through the FDA, but if you can put out the right PR, uh, then the shares of the uh, people uh, influential in the company can uh, go up in value and they can make hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight. So again, you see, the incentives are not in the right direction. Now, we as a community, uh, uh, most of the gay community has been unwilling to deal with treatment issues because they figure, well, it's technical or as to the leave for the experts. It's not a traditional thing where traditionally we've been dealing with civil rights. Uh, but uh, uh, somebody has to, to deal with it. There should be 10 people doing you know, newsletters like I'm doing. For example, somebody should be working full time on KS. Uh, it, could, it could use you know, the kind of research. I, mean, I, I write one of these things every two weeks. Uh, somebody could be doing, uh, you know, KS would, uh, could spend my whole time on just doing that. And, uh, uh, there are, are so many uh, um, uh, different uh, approaches. There's so many things that I hear about and can't pursue because uh, there are just too many. Uh, it's impossible for, uh, for one person to, to keep up. And uh, it, it seems appalling that this far into the epidemic that uh, it's ended up, you know, I'm doing this kind of by default. I'm not a professional. I'd rather, I'd rather have uh, uh, this done by you know uh, institutions, by uh, uh, by by physicians, uh, by co community cooperation that that will get together the investigative reporters, uh, physicians. Yeah, let, let me just say a little bit about how this could be organized. The key step in in finding out about these treatments that otherwise are just left to sit in many cases is investigative reporting. So the way the community what the community can do is to go to find reporters who already have experience as reporters as journalists and to have some, preferably have some medical background or information, then get them in touch with people with AIDS and ARC, many of whom are, are just uh, uh, experts. They spend their whole time studying uh, treatments. Then the reporters can interview them, can get the leads that go around through the networking of these grapevines, 
and take those leads, call physicians, call the scientists, call the uh, government officials, find out uh, what uh, is, uh, you know, sift through the information, what's reliable and what's not, and then find out why isn't anything happening and uh, uh, look for just where the, uh, the bottlenecks are. And it's amazing when you look at some of these bottlenecks, they go away because the institutions involved are ashamed to, uh, <laughs> to, to let it keep going. <laughs> So uh, th that's the that's the message that uh, uh, we we've got to have uh, uh, we've got to have community lobbying that is uh, willing and able to get into the details of of the treatments and you don't have to be a scientist to to understand uh, 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 what's going on but it does take time and uh, and uh, then that's that's willing to uh, uh, to lobby on that basis. We would like. That's L E N, L E N T I N, A N. We'd like to ask the panelists if they'd be willing to stay for one more half hour to do some questions and answers. Some people have to go. Yeah. Okay. So, can some people stay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. We've tried as much as we could to group the questions together so that we get as many, you know, so that we're answering the questions that were asked the most um, often. Uh, the first question has to do with AL721. Um, people, lots and lots of people asked questions about it, and there were sort of two kinds of questions. One was, were questions that came from people who were obviously taking it or contemplating taking it and wanted to know what about all these versions that are available in New York? Is there a better or worse version? What about dosage? And um, what about the issue of diet while you're taking AL721? Um, the second question that had to do with AL721 has to do with the political issues. People really, really want to understand more about what the delays have been in the, in the clinical trials in AL721 and why it seemed to have been so hard to manufacture when, when uh, buyers clubs and PWA health group has been able to do it. Is it that the version is really so inadequate or is there something else? So we wondered if a few people on the panel could try to answer both of those questions. Making it. I think I already outlined that even the company that officially has the license for making AL721 and the marketing rights obviously appears to have great trouble making batches that are identical. The, the, some of the ones that we have received look different, the consistency is different, and they've had great trouble uh, meeting FDA criteria because it is a food product, bacteria grow in it very easily, so it can spoil like food and uh, can start to smell bad because it spoils. And at the same time, because the cholesterol is removed on an acetone basis, another problem they have had is that there were too many parts per million of acetone in some of the batches that they submitted to the FDA. Now, I think when you realize that even the official company has that much trouble making the thing, making, making something that is, is purported to be the stuff that was first developed at the Weizmann Institute, it is uh, even more important to know that we should have some type of quality control on what's being sold on the street. And there clearly are a tremendous number of, uh, of underground laboratories that have made this stuff the, the only thing I can tell you about the material that the PWA sells is uh, material that is made in Japan and sold in Japan as a health food product called, uh, I think, egg yolk oil in Japan. And um, I do know that it's been tested uh, in a laboratory and apparently has much of the activity that AL721 has. So that um, I cannot make any, any statement at all 
about what is coming out of the underground laboratory. I've been told that the the sheet that says you can mix up various substances at home, including olive oil, makes this compound that has nothing, uh, that has no none of the effects that AL721 has. The only thing I can say for the PWA compound is that at least it is made by a manufacturer that uh, is permitted to sell this in health food stores in Japan. Um, so much on the issue of, of quality control. Clearly, there can be a lot of differences in what you're selling, what you're getting underground, maybe even less close to the real stuff than some of the batches that we dealt with, which was supposedly official stuff. Now, the other question I've, uh, was what? The delays in the uh, protocol. Um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't know all the background of the, of the protocols. Uh, I can only tell you that the company that has the license from the Weizmann Institute is clearly a very, very small company, unlike Burroughs Welcome, and one of, and, uh, which is a, one of these international uh, multifaceted pharmaceutical houses that clearly have a number of successful drugs. The international drug companies all have a lot of money and hence have also the public relations and the ability to develop something that looks more promising, uh, much better than a company that has never done that. So that some of the delay that has occurred with the AL721 may come due to the, f or maybe due to the fact that it's not been licensed or that the license isn't all being owned by a company that has a tremendous amount of experience with it. But that's a speculation of mine. I really don't know the background. Could could we ask uh, Michael Callan to comment on the AL721 that PWA Health Group has been distributing? Okay, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that there are other PWA Health Group board members here. Andy Hammond, Jim Fraud, and Joe Sonnabend is uh, our medical advisor for the health group. One thing that disturbs me is when people refer to the people with health, uh, PWA Health Group product. At the current time, we offer product manufactured by three and soon to be four manufacturers, and as Dr. Lang mentioned, there are differences between the products. Um, the f best way to answer the question, I think, is to tell you a little bit about the history and the philosophy. Uh, two years ago, uh, um, Dr. Robert Gallo published, sent a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine saying basically that he had tested lipids in the test tube and thought it was one of the most promising avenues f to, to uh, pursue. And people started to uh, go to Israel and come back with very exciting anecdotal reports of improvement. So several people, uh, and uh, several people who in my mind are heroes, uh, Tom Hannon comes immediately to mind, said, how can we get lipids to people who want them? While everybody else dilly-dallies and the FDA sort of looks around and the Praxis does what it does or doesn't do, is there a way that we can make lipids available to people who want it? And we had several, we made several attempts to get Praxis Pharmaceuticals to deliver product and got the runaround. And um, to make a long story short, Tom Hannon and a group of other people found that there was a company on Long Island that had in its catalog a lipid substance, lipids are used to emulsify chocolate and as a food additive, had a lipid substance that was very, very close to AL721. We had it analyzed at a chemical lab and looked at the specs and we had the patent information so we knew what Praxis had. So for a while, uh, at great risk to ourselves and it was really a backbreaking effort, we sort of walked this thin line. We're not selling it as a drug. We, we brought it into this country as a food substance, and the FDA didn't like it one bit, but didn't really pursue us. So in the early days, uh, the only way to get AL721 or an AL721 analog was to purchase it through the health group, which was one, it was an, the American Roland product. There were, were other ways to get it, which was there were private individuals making it in their kitchen. Um, but the only way to make it available on a regular and on a commercial scale was initially through the health group. Then, but now, several manufacturers have entered the market. And what the PWA health group is attempting to do is to function as a consumer protection thing. We test every batch that we sell. We make the 
the precise chemical specifications available to those who want to see them. We're trying to keep the price down, and we've just announced a price reduction. We've organized buyers groups, or, or let's say buyers groups have sprung up in other parts of the country as a result of information that we've provided, and we're now joining forces to drive the price down, make sure that the product is properly refrigerated, and sort of set standards for lipids. Um, we, ha we are, n people with AIDS want certainty, and that is the one thing that I think we're not able to provide, not just in terms of lipids, but in terms of the whole issue of treatment. We know a little bit about the efficacy of lipids in a ratio of seven to two to one, based on studies that Dr. Shinitsky did. We have no idea what variation from the ideal ratio of seven to two to one matters. We haven't answered that question. We don't have dose questions to be answered. What we try to do is to come as close to seven to two to one as is possible. But as Dr. Lang points out, it varies from batch to batch. And we have sort of arbitrarily, after discussions with lipid experts and with the inventor and anybody who will talk to us, said that we will only sell uh, lipids that are roughly within a plus or, plus or minus two points to the seven to two to one ratio, specifically in terms of, of the one. So um, I don't know if that answered any of your questions, but lipids is not an area of exact science. And there's been a lot of charges and counter charges and which product is best and one smells different and one tastes different. And we, the health group at least, is about making safe product available to you at the cheapest price possible. And those of you who turn to us looking for us to tell you that lipids are going to be a cure or that this group of lipids is better than this group of lipids, we just, as much as we'd love to be able to tell you that, we really can't. So that's the story of lipids, at least from the PWA Health Group perspective. Okay, another question is that people asked us about a list of about, I would say, 10 or 15 drugs. Um, everything that John James talks about and probably everything listed in the AMFAR directory, sort of what about. And it's hard to know how to, you know, have an intelligent discussion of that kind of thing. I'm going to read you the names of the drugs in a minute so we can get some comments from the panelists. But one thing I want to mention to all of you is that if you look on your handout, you'll see that, that, that CGHAP has put together a sort of little loose leaf notebook of articles on various kinds of treatments, primarily relying on John James's information and the AMFAR directory and some other stuff. And a copy of it is going to be available on campus in the mental health division and by calling the PWAC. So if you want to read about fusidic acid or lentinin or amplogen, you can go and, and get the book and read about it. Um, let me uh, read the list of drugs. One of the things that we'd like to particularly ask about this, and we hope that some of the people on the panel would know about this, is whether clinical trials on any of these drugs are going to be done in the New York area in the near future. And we'd also like to know whether any of the panelists have anything particular to say about some of these drugs that they see as particularly promising or particularly dangerous. The list we got included fusidic acid, DNCB, Fancidar, DHPG, Lentinan, Amplogen, Isoprinazine, Ribavirin, BHT, Dextran, Sulfate, and every combination of the above. So, uh, anyone want to start that? Okay. Fusidic acid, DNCB, Fancidar, DHPG, Lentinan, Amplogen, Isoprinazine, ribavirin, BHT, and dextran sulfate. And one of the things that people wanted to know was what about any of these things in combination with AZT? Well, so, some of these drugs are, are antiviral drugs, and some of the drugs are immunomodulating drugs, and some of the drugs listed are drugs used to treat opportunistic infections like CMV and uh, uh, pneumocystis. So I think we should, for, for the purposes now, exclude those, uh, those drugs uh, in the treatment of opportunistic infections and just focus on antiviral drugs and immunomodulator drugs. Um, I, the, the list is long. I'm sure we all have our own personal opinions about 
about the theory and, and, and the results that have been shown so far um, uh, about all of them. I don't know exactly how we're going to handle this question at, at this stage, but um, to look, just personally look at a couple of them. Amplogen had a preliminary study a couple um, of months ago uh, uh, in the Lancet in which several patients with lymphadenopathy syndrome and ARC and full-blown AIDS went from uh, virus culture positive to virus culture negative via a variety of assays. Um, some with lower, uh, with higher T cell counts imp improved their total T cell count. And I think most people will agree that it's a promising agent and deserves um, much further study. Other drugs on this list like BHT have uh, much less in the way of even anecdotal evidence to support their use. Dextran sulfate is very preliminary. I wouldn't at this point, I advise anybody to take dextran sulfate under, um, uh, you know, until more is known. Um, some, of, some of the drugs listed here are not even available at all. Lentinin, uh, is even in an underground market, I have not heard of, um, that it's available. Um, and as John James mentioned, there's a trial that will, will be beginning in San Francisco on lentinin. Um, really, I think in, in, the, in the context of this audience, what, what, what we want to know about is the things that are available to us. Fusidic acid is available if you go to Canada. DNCB is available now. Isoprinosine is available. Ribavirin is available. And, and I, BHT is available. So I think if, we, if, if uh, someone had some comments on some of those things. Okay. <laughs> I have a comment. Um, <laughs> uh, fusidic acid, I think, is, is very, very preliminary. Um, uh, they, they have found that um, you can inhibit HIV at concentrations that you can achieve by taking oral doses of fusidic acid. But, but, um, and, and we have one case report of a guy who was on fusidic acid, but when you, when you call the investigator, you find out, oh, yeah, he was on AZT. Um, as well, he was only on fusidic acid for, for a total of two months. I think that case study was a little bit kind of uh, selectively reported. I think there's really no evidence to support fusidic acid right now. Um, if I may make an interruption, it's also important to say that this patient had tuberculosis and I believe had 400 T4 cells at the time he took the, um, to, took the fusidic acid, so he did not even have a true AIDS opportunistic infection condition. Right, and, and his T cells were measured after he was on fusidic acid for two months and he was on AZT. So we don't know, uh, and they went up to 900, but we don't know what, uh, what drug caused that increase in T cells. Um, DNCB is a, is a chemical that's painted on the skin that sensitizes the skin and um, is, was thought to be just sort of a general immune stimulant. Um, very little data right now to support the use of DNCB. I have not seen any personal. Um, when I was in, in practice, I did not see anyone's T cells increase um, on DNCB, nor did I see it make uh, KS lesions fade away, as, as is reported in some of the, uh, the popular press. So um, uh, I haven't seen any, any real success with DNCB. I don't know if anyone here has. When if a sensitized person uh, places the DNCB on lesions, uh, I have seen some lesions actually treated, and that's all you'd expect in the same way warts have been treated with uh, DNCB, but that's not a systemic effect at all. Are there any other comments on these drugs? And I'd like to mention a little bit about uh, ribavirin, uh, because it's, I think it's an instructive in terms of uh, problems of clinical research. Uh, there was a large trial now going back, I guess, more than a year uh, that was a multi-center trial involving a number of centers, including uh, here in New York, uh, Cornell, uh, where they divided patients into three groups. Uh, one group got a placebo, one group got low-dose ribavirin, and the other group got a high-dose. And uh, 10 patients in the placebo group got progressed from uh, ARC to AIDS and I think uh, uh, six people in the low dose progressed and none in, in the high dose progressed and there it looked like it was a wonderful drug. Unfortunately, uh, there were some major problems in the protocol in that the, one of the centers failed to stratify their patients and all of their patients with very low T4 cells were in the placebo group. So you would expect that they would uh, have a higher risk of progression. And for that reason, the, the 
many of us believe this drug may have some potential effectiveness, but it hasn't been demonstrated because of the um, failure to carefully do a study where people are matched uh, in a way. So the, the point that I think we need to know is that uh, when studies are done to get information, it's important that they be done uh, in a way that we can interpret it. And a, uh, you know, a bad study that people publish is in some ways worse than not you know, doing it at all. Another question had to do with uh, uh, prevention of PCP. Um, a very br and we'd like to ask this particularly to Dr. Armstrong. Um, a very brief question is that he mentioned the Beth Nebulizer. Could he specify what that is? And the second is, um, in terms of PC pre PCP prophylaxis, people would like some comparison of the effectiveness of and use of AZT, pentamidine, dapsone, bactrim, and fancidar in, in a few minutes or less. The, uh, I don't know what the best nebulizer is. The nebulizer, two nebulizers that we compared, the Fisoneb, it's called Fisoneb, and it's uh, distributed through um, Massachusetts, a, a, a company in Massachusetts, which is called Fison. So Fisoneb was the better of the two that we tested. The other was called a, a Simmons machine, a microinhalator. Uh, there are many ways of, of, of delivering aerosols, and, and uh, it, it's, I think it's important just to have a small enough particle size so it gets out into where the, the organism is. Uh, the answer to the other questions is, is, is relatively easy because there have been no control studies to document that uh, the agents aimed at pneumocystis crinii uh, can prevent it. Uh, that includes Fancidar, where there has been toxicity and breakthroughs. That includes Dapsone, uh, where that does seem promising, but there have been no good control studies. Uh, and intravenous pentamidine, where there have been no uh, control studies. AZT does seem to delay the onset of pneumocystis and to, uh, it results in a more mild episode of pneumocystis. So that I, I, I think that has been uh, relatively well documented in the AZT study. So unfortunately, I, you know, I wish I could say that, that, that uh, there, there is a way which we know will prevent PCP, but as yet we don't. The other, go ahead. Uh, there has been one study uh, in leukemics looking at uh, Bactrim prophylaxis given intermittently, which uh, showed its efficacy. Uh, I think the problems with many of these drugs are that many patients can't take them, that they either develop allergic reactions or are intolerant to side effects that the drugs may, you know, induce. But uh, it's been, I think, clinically uh, the experience of most clinicians that people who stay on uh, many of the prophylactic regimens, including uh, two double-strength Bactrim receptor tablets a day or Dapsone or high dose fancid are, if they can tolerate it, the incidence of recurrent pneumonia seems to be significantly lower than controls of historical controls of patients who uh, in the early days of uh, AIDS when we didn't realize that it was appropriate to try and prevent recurrent pneumonia. Um, one other comment about the nebulizers. A uh, problem with nebulization is that all the nebulizers developed have been for people with lung diseases like asthma where you want the material to get into the airway to do the effect of bronchodilating. For PCP prophylaxis, it's different. You want the drug to get into the lung sacs, the alveoli themselves. And uh, most of the nebulizers that have been developed have actually aimed at not doing that. And uh, there are some nebulizers that are being now promoted as producing smaller particle size that may get into the alveoli. Um, specifically, and I think, uh, I don't know if the efficacy has been shown, there is a pulmonic, um, what's the last? No, it's not the Pulmonate, no, the pulmonic, um, by, made by DeVilbis, which is a ultrasonic nebulizer that seems to have a very small particle size and it looks promising. Can but I just take a, a, interrupt you for a second, Dan? Um, I just wanted to mention before we, we close that uh, GMHC is now coming out with an AIDS treatment newsletter. Um, it's called Treatment Issues, and you can contact GMHC, Department of Medical Information, to get it. The reason I wanted to mention, other than the fact that we're doing our premier issue this week, um, is that we, we have an article on aerosolized pentamidine, and it, and it does compare the, the various nebulizers and what we found out. And, um, 
lists uh, the distributors of, uh, of the, uh, the nebulizers locally. Um, if I could make a comment, I'd like to make one on DAP zone, because in our institution at St. Luke's Roosevelt, we have used much more DAP zone for pneumocystis prophylaxis and we've used inhal inhalational pentamidine. And Dr. Armstrong is quite correct in saying that this was not a controlled study, but it was based on a workshop at the NIH in 1984 where Dr. Walter Hughes who well, I think Dr. Armstrong will agree with me as sort of the senior dean on pneumocystis probably in the world, certainly in the United States.